All right, welcome to week four English science. This week we're talking about evolution. Um, we're gonna begin with Charles Darwin, which was a, yeah, next slide, British nat nat uh, naturalist. And he was kind of like the founding father or contributed a large part to theories of evolution. In 1831 to 1836, he was part of an expedition on HMS Beagle, which went to places like South America, Australia, and et cetera, to study plants and animals. And especially notable in his travels was the Galapagos Islands. There, um, basically there's like a lot of islands in that area and they each kind of have their own unique environmental conditions. And he noticed that each region's finches had different traits, even though they all look like they were from the same species. So that was a major part that contributed to his theories of evolution and natural selection, where each region's finches gradually adapted to local conditions and that led to development of new species. And we will talk about that more in the later slides. So naturalist is an expert in natural history, which is what Darwin was. He studied the sciences and um, our world. Expedition is a journey or voyage for a particular purpose. And in this purpose was for scientific research. Finches are a type of so uh, songbird and species is a group of living organisms with similar characteristics that are capable of exchanging genes or interbreeding. So for example, humans are a species or we often say that there are, which species of dogs did you, dog did you get? Did you get a chihuahua or um, golden retriever? That's also species. Next slide, please. On the origin of species is a book that Darwin published with his theories and conclusions from his voyage. And that talks about two things, mainly evolution and natural selection. Evolution is when species can change over time and new species come from pre-existing species. He calls it descent with modification Basically, as time progresses, the descendants of the previous parents or previous species change their heritable traits over generations because of environmental circumstances or just want to, like by chance, a trait that they developed helps them survive better. And evolution is basically the overarching progression of, for example, from um, chimpanzee to humans, they develop, they, we don't have a tail anymore, or we don't have fur covering our skin as much as the chimpanzee. Over time, that's called evolution. Natural selection is a mechanism of evolution where nature selects for traits that appear by chance, which helps you increase fitness, which is survival and ability to reproduce. For example, um, if a giraffe one day develops, like mute, has a mutated gene and develops a longer neck, that might mean that they can reach the food on the tree easily and nature will select for that trait, which is longer necks. And he will survive better and have more offsprings because he can eat more and sur survive longer. And more offsprings will have that long neck because that characteristic or long neck is beneficial. And again, natural selection will be um, elaborated on in the next slides. And these basically explain the patterns he saw during his trip. Descent is or origin, origin, sorry, or transmission of qualities. So as parent goes to child, um, you're a descendant of your mom and dad. Heritable is when something is transmissible from parent to offsprings. For example, your parents both have blue eyes and that might be a heritable trait. So you'll also have blue eyes. And traits are a quality or a characteristic. 
um, again, like your eye color or your skin color or how curly your hair is. And generation, like we kind of explained um, before, is just um, as parent, like you and your cousin are in one generation and your children are in another generation. Okay, so we mentioned about the evolution and we are now going to look at the five evidence of evolutions. So there's fossil record, biogeography, comparative anatomy, comparative embryology, and molecular biology. First, let's look at the fossil record. So the fossils are often exist in the rock, like on the left side of this, like there's different layer of rock and it forms as the organism died and was buried under the mud and the sand. So we can see there's different layer built on up each other over the time. So we can refer to that the bottom layer should be the oldest and the top layer will be the youngest. And the fossil ended will indicate like which time period they are in and how the biodiversity has changed over the time. So here's the geologic table, like there's different era period and also, yeah, over the billion and million of years. Okay, so that is fossil record that tell us how the diversity change and now is the biogeography. So about 200 million years ago, there's a super, like single super large continent called Pangaea. And because of the tectonic plants moving over the time, which is also called the continental drift, it slowly broke up and um through million of year and each into our present day like there's different continent asia africa south america north america australia antarctica and it's also like even in the present day is still moving the tectonic plant and it never stopped how about geography relate to our biodiversity and evolution is that we could see the geography distribution of the organism. So on the right picture, we could see like there are certain species that both live in Amer South America and also Africa and also like the pattern of it because like some species is really unique and like it's been found in both continents. So it could infer that, refer that, um, infer to that the Pangaea did exist in um, before. So yeah, so through the study of the biogeography, we know that the Pangaea did exist and like how the biodiversity had distributed over the world. Okay, so now let's look at anatomy. There's two type of structure that I think is important to know. One is homologous structure and analogous structure. One is the variation on a common anatomical structure. Like for example, there's human, cat, horse, bat, and dolphin. Like, they have different use of it, like dolphin use that to swim, bat use that to fly, human use that to like, um, like hand, like um, to take other things, like they are, or have different use of it, but they have the common structure. And this kind of structure is like the opposite of it. They have the um, very similar function, but their structure is nearly totally different. So here's a table that um, compare two type of structure. So like we said before, the homology structure is similar structure, but different function. And they all live in different environments and share recent common ancestor. And this kind of evolution is called divergent evolution because 
they are from the common ancestor, like re really recently common ancestor into the different type of function. And this type of um, analogous structure is different structure but have very similar function. They live in a similar environment and but they have a really distant common ancestor because their function is different and how they evolve into having the same function like like we talked about before the fish bird um shark penguin dolphin both use them to swim in the water and but their structure is different okay so now is comparative embryology the closer related the species and organism they are the more similar in their embryonic that development. So we could see how their development of the like the cell and how it go to different organisms. Okay, so the last one is molecular biology. So there's four biological molecules for life that every organism has: the nuclear acid, protein carbohydrate and lipid. So comparing this cell to like in different organism, we could see how related and how similar they are. And it is also another indicator for like the biodiversity and evolution. So we have finished our five evidence for evolution. Now we're moving on to the natural selection. We have talked about a little bit about it before, but now we're gonna go deep into it. So natural selection is a process that occurs slowly over time. It allows for population to adapt and mutate uh, due to its environment. And the process of natural selection can be simplified into three main steps. So step one, each individual in a population has to have a unique combination of genes, which result into individuals with different tra traits. Um, number, step number two, uh, individuals with traits that are well suited for their environments tend to be healthier and live longer and produce more offsprings. And this is the exact definition of natural selection, which means that natural selection uh, the means that the nature uh, favors a side who has like better adapt to its environment, which will end up being producing more offsprings and others. And step number three is that each new generation will show more favorable traits and fewer less desirable traits. So that means that once like if um certain species have muted to have a trait, that is beneficial and for them to survive in that certain environment, that means their offsprings are more likely to adapt to that trait. But if, that, if it is the opposite, that the trait, the mutation is like uh, causing them to like uh, have a decrease in their population as not like helpful or anything, then the offspring were more likely to not have that mutation. And now we're going to talk about some sample examples of uh, adaptation. And today we're going to be talking about three of them. So the first one we are going to be talking about is a common mutation we see in different species. It's called a camouflage. So on the left, we got a leopard and uh, it uses special coloration to head in trees and to like, to weigh an ambush for the prey. And this allows the leopard to get closer before being attacked. And this increases its chance of getting a meal. And on the right, the snow short hair has a white coat of fur in the winter. It can be used this adaptation to hide from the snow from the predators. So this is the exact opposite of the leopard. So which also shows that camouflage can be used for different purposes.
And the second type of adaptation that today we're going to be talking about is mimicry. So one of these butterflies in the two pictures are uh, are first first arrived butterflies, and one of them is a monarch butterfly. Monarch butterflies are the ones to be known as poisonous. So like once like a, a certain bird has like eat the monarch monarch butterflies so they end up they're obviously like dead so after a certain like bird that has eaten like end up dying then the bird after that will know that they shouldn't probably eat it so the first right is not poisonous but adapted the coloration almost identical to the monarch butterfly so which means that uh, he's trying to like trick the birds into thinking that he is also poisonous so which means that he will likely to survive and avoid being eaten by predators so the one on the left is the verse right and you can tell the difference by like the verse right has like additional black horizontal stripes on its wings And the last type of adaptations we're going to be talking about is warning color, right? Coloration. So the scientific experiments have shown that it only takes one encounter with a toxic or aggressive species for a predator to leave or avoid. So this is exactly what I was like talking about in the previous slide about the monarch butterflies. After its predator has like sort of eased it and like dies or being hurt, then the next time that species will know to avoid that certain um, animal. So the eyed hawk moth displays this unique adaptation of like eye spots when it feels threatened. This may startle a potential predator, allowing them like more time to escape. So it's like the picture on the la left where they have like those li little eyes, which will scare of predator and that might help them survive. And the, on the right is the red poison dwarf frog. So, and that's like very colorful. Uh, the color adaptation means like to, it was meant to warn predators that they are not like uh, edible, <laughs> but like poison dwarf frog, like sea crew like a poisonous substance through their skin which can harm like other species and by that now the predators like all of the predators kind of know that more colorful um, species is that means is more likely to be poisonous or harmful and now we have finished talking about some examples of adaptation or mutations. Now we're going to be talking about the four conditions of natural selection. So the four conditions are needed for natural selection to occur are reproduction, heredity, and var variation in fitness for organism, variation in individual characters among members of population. And if all of them are met, natural selection automatically results. But today we will only be talking about the first two, reproduction and heredity, because the last two is a little bit complicated to explain and we will not be using them very much. So the first one is reproduction. Uh, you mean the act more like per process of like producing offspring basically and a condition necessary for the evolution to occur is the uh, parent plant produce like more offspring uh, that can like normally survive so like the average result of the reproduction is that like a parent plant leaves like one descendant that uh, reproduce yet like many so reproduce that dies so that means that uh, the whatever the parent have to produce like more, more like uh, offsprings to for them to be able to survive. So these offsprings are able to produce more offsprings. I don't know if that makes sense. Uh, next slide. So the second one is heredity. Uh, so this is the mechanism of transmission of 
specific characters who are trying from a parent to offspring. So this is the another condition necessary to the evolution or the uh, natural selection. So uh, occurs to that the child of the fittest phenotype that survive are inherited by successful uh, project. So this is what we were talking about earlier. So like uh, tr traits or mutations that are like that benefits the species themselves or like help them survive are more tend to like uh, pass to their offsprings, which was like is showing the picture of the right. And um, so molecular gen genetics, which we talked about a few slides before, and biochemistry provide like significant information about how this process occurred. If you wanted to learn more about it, I guess you can search it up. And the other two, which we will not be talking about today, is the uh, variation fitness and the variation in individual characters among the members of the population. And if, also, if you want to learn more about these two, you can also search them out by yourself. And lastly, we have a video explaining about the natural selection. Hopefully, it uh, explains well more like better than me. The theory of evolution was developed by Charles Darwin and published in his book on the origin of species. He explained that natural selection is a process behind evolution. Charles Darwin developed his theories after his adventures upon the HMS Beagle. In his travels, he observed that creatures found on the islands he visited were similar to ones found on the mainland, but appeared to be slightly different. It wasn't until he returned home that he came to the conclusion that species are specially modified to their environments and that's why they differ. He developed four conditions explaining why this happens. Darwin's theory of natural selection by descent with modification is testable and observable fact. Experiments have been conducted in the wild and in labs. Let's dive deeper into Darwin's four conditions. Condition number one, individuals within a population differ. There are features that differ within populations of the same animal. In our case, the feature that varies between our giraffes is neck length. Some giraffes were born with long necks, some were born with short necks. Condition number two. The differences are, at least in part, passed from parents to offspring. Darwin's descent with modification is the idea that offspring are fairly similar to their parents with some genetic differences. Condition number three, some individuals are more successful at surviving and reproducing than others. In the case of our giraffes, the long neck individual did not acquire its neck by stretching to grab the leaves. Instead, individuals within the population were born with the neck length that was longer than others. Because the longer neck allowed them to reach the food that was otherwise unattainable, it gave them an advantage. Condition number four, the successful individuals succeed because of variant traits they have inherited and will pass on to their offspring. Mark, mark. Giraffes with the longer neck advantage are in better health and able to pass this feature to their offspring. Because this trait is more successful than shorter necks, more individuals in the population have it. Over time, this process can result in populations that specialize for particular environments and may eventually result in emergence of new species. In other words, natural selection is an important process, though not the only process, by which evolution takes place within a population of organisms. Let's review. Individuals within a population differ. The differences are, at least in part, passed from parents to offspring. Some individuals are more successful at surviving and reproducing than others. Excuse me. The successful individuals succeed because of variant traits they have inherited and will pass on to their offspring. That's all for now. Thanks for watching. Mark, mark. And here's our sources. And thank you everyone for viewing our video.
Bye. Bye.